This channel has explored extensively why Bitcoin is an incredible technology that will appreciate in value forever, fix a broken financial system, and make everybody that understands it and adopts it wealthy along the way. But in order to truly build conviction in the best performing asset of the last 16 years, let's explore some of the biggest risks to Bitcoin success and see if there's anything that could bring down the most powerful and secure computing network in history. In this video, we'll look at quantum computing, 51% network attacks or mining centralization, software bugs, blockchain bloat, competing cryptocurrencies, CBDCs, custodial risk or self-custody. Quantum computing could be a problem for Bitcoin because it might eventually break the encryption that keeps Bitcoin secure. Right now, Bitcoin uses complex math called Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm, or ECDSA, to protect your private keys. Regular computers can't crack it. However, a super powerful quantum computer could one day figure out private keys from public keys, allowing hackers to steal Bitcoin from active wallets if quantum computers became much more advanced, faster than expected, it could threaten Bitcoin security. But here's the reality. Quantum computing isn't anywhere near that level yet. Experts say it could take decades before it becomes a real threat. Even if progress speeds up, the Bitcoin community is already prepping by working on new quantum-resistant encryption. Since Bitcoin is open source, developers around the world can collaborate to upgrade its security. Also, if quantum computers were ever to reach the point where they can break Bitcoin, they would also put things like online banking, military systems, and website security at risk. Because of this, experts everywhere are already working on ways to secure digital information against quantum threats. Since Bitcoin is flexible and can be upgraded, it's very likely to adapt long before quantum computing becomes an actual danger. A 51% attack happens when a single entity or group gains control of more than half of Bitcoin's mining power or hash rate. If this happens, they could double spending coins, blocking other users' transactions, or even reversing recent transactions. This could undermine trust in the network and damage Bitcoin's reputation as secure. In theory, a large mining pool or a coordinated group of miners could attempt this, especially if mining becomes too centralized. And while this might sound scary, it's extremely unlikely to happen due to the immense energy and compute power required to pull it off. As of early 2025, the Bitcoin network is secured by between 155 terawatt hours and 172 terawatt hours of electricity per year, comparable to the entire energy usage of a country like Poland, and is more energy usage than the entire United States Navy. To successfully carry out a 51% attack, an attacker would need to control more than half of this mining power, which means securing at least 78 terawatt hours to 86 terawatt hours annually. This would involve purchasing and running millions of high-powered mining rigs, costing billions and billions of dollars in hardware and electricity alone. And, in reality, adding additional mining rigs to the system in an attempt to overthrow it just further decentralizes the network and increases the difficulty for an attack like this to be successful. So even if someone managed the impossible task of gathering the necessary resources, there's no incentive to do so. Successfully attacking Bitcoin would cause its value to plummet, making any financial gain from the attack meaningless. So you could have spent hundreds of billions of dollars with no return on that investment. And just to reassure you that this is never going to happen, the current trend in mining is towards decentralization as more and more smaller miners join the network and increase the security as time goes on. The sheer cost, complexity, and global distribution of mining make a 51% attack on Bitcoin not just unlikely, but virtually impossible at this point. Software bugs can also be a risk to Bitcoin because a critical flaw in the code could cause unexpected behavior, like transaction malfunctions, security vulnerabilities, or even network disruptions. One notable example was the 2010 overflow bug, where someone managed to create billions of Bitcoin in a single transaction due to a coding error. The community responded quickly by coordinating a soft fork to reverse the invalid transaction and fix the issue. Because Bitcoin is open source, it's maintained by a global community of highly skilled developers who constantly review and test it for vulnerabilities. Even if a bug were found, not all nodes would necessarily be affected, and the global community would quickly identify the issue, propose a solution, and implement an update, as they have done in the past. Blockchain bloat is when the Bitcoin blockchain gets so big that it becomes harder for regular users to store and keep up with it. 
As the transaction history grows, it requires more storage and bandwidth to run a full node. If the blockchain gets too big, fewer people might run nodes, leading to less decentralization and weaker network security. However, this is less of a risk than it sounds. Developers have already implemented solutions like SegWit and Taproot to reduce data size and featured like pruned nodes let users store just part of the blockchain while still verifying transactions. Layer 2 solutions like the Lightning Network help reduce the number of on-chain transactions as technology improves and storage becomes cheaper, running a full node will stay accessible, keeping the network secure and decentralized. To compare Bitcoin to other cryptocurrencies, we need to understand the blockchain trilemma, the trade-off between security, scalability, and decentralization. Most blockchains can only optimize for two of the three. Bitcoin chooses security and decentralization, making it highly trustless and censorship resistant, but it sacrifices speed and scalability, handling only seven transactions per second without layer two solutions like the Lightning Network boosting it to a million transactions per second. Solana opts for scalability and decentralization, offering fast, cheap transactions, but it requires powerful hardware, making it more centralized and less secure risking network instability and potential censorship. XRP, Ripple, focuses on speed and security, processing transactions quickly and cheaply. However, it's very centralized, controlled only by a few institutions, which undermines the trustless, censorship-resistant nature of crypto. So in order to be a global, public, trustless financial network that is not controlled by a powerful few, the only combination that works is decentralization and security. Without decentralization, you run into all the same problems as fiat money, and without security, there's not much point in being a global financial network. That's why Bitcoin's design, despite its slower base layer, is best suited for long-term value storage and freedom. Central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs, are digital versions of national currencies controlled by central banks. Some people worry that as governments develop and launch CBDCs, they could undermine Bitcoin's adoption and usage. CBDCs could offer faster payments, easier tax collection, and more direct stimulus distribution, making them seem more practical for everyday use. However, CBDCs pose significant risks to personal freedom and privacy. CBDCs give governments total control over financial transactions. This means they could track every payment, freeze accounts, or impose programmable spending limits. While CBDCs might gain traction for convenience and compliance, they ultimately represent the opposite of what Bitcoin stands for, financial sovereignty and individual freedom. Bitcoin's decentralized nature means it's incredibly resistant to control, as long as people recognize the benefits of a system secured by energy and math and not under human control, they'll choose Bitcoin and Bitcoin will continue to exist and thrive. Self-custody means holding your Bitcoin in a wallet where you control the private keys rather than leaving it on an exchange or with a third-party service. Most people see self-custody as risky because losing your private keys means permanently losing your Bitcoin with no way to recover it. Managing your own security requires responsibility, such as using secure hardware wallets, using open source wherever possible, keeping backup seed phrases safe and understanding potential threats like phishing or hardware failure. This can feel daunting, especially for those new to digital finance. But self-custody is fundamental to Bitcoin's philosophy of financial freedom. It gives you full ownership and control over your money. You're not relying on an exchange that could get hacked, go bankrupt, or have your account frozen. History shows that even well-known platforms can fail, leaving users locked out of their funds. Self-custody removes the third-party risk entirely. To make things even safer, many people use multi-signature wallets, which require more than one key to access your Bitcoin. Kind of like needing two keys to open a vault. This adds another layer of protection in case one key is lost or compromised. It might sound intimidating at first, but new tools and platforms make it easier and safer by the day. Just remember, not your keys, not your coins. Right, so there you have it. Bitcoin does come with some risks. But just like any other revolutionary technology, whether it's quantum computing, network attacks, or competing cryptocurrencies, it's important to understand these challenges. Bitcoin's open source, decentralized nature means that it's survived countless attacks and has developed impressive resilience over time. At the end of the day, Bitcoin's strengths far outweigh its weaknesses. It's smart to be aware of the risks, but equally important to recognize the incredible innovation and security that Bitcoin represents. 
Stay curious, stay informed, and most importantly, keep learning. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.